I am joined this morning uh, by Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope, and I'm excited to talk to you today because we've got an incredible event coming April 8th, the total solar eclipse. It goes straight through Texas. This hasn't happened since 1878. Uh, tell me about this event. Well, you know, Anthony, total solar eclipses happen about every 18 months on average somewhere on the Earth. And the U.S. has just been dialed in recently. We had one in 2017, and we're having one again, you know, this coming April. And it's a fantastic opportunity to see what's got to be one of the most amazing natural sights you can ever hope to. Um, and uh, what I think is, is really incredible about you uh, that, that cover these for Sky and Telescope is you speak at all our weather conferences, the National Weather Association, the American Meteorological Society. So I, I always love listening to you and what you have to say about what's going on in space, but particularly for the uh, total solar eclipses. How many have you seen? <laughs> Well, this one coming up will be number 16 for me. And, uh, you know, I started early. I had my whole career with Sky and Telescope, so I got the lucky opportunity to see many of them over the North Pole, over the South Pole, uh, three in Africa. It's just, it's a list that's just amazing. But as I said, these happen all over the world, and so it's given me a great opportunity to do a lot of traveling. Uh, let's specifically talk about Houston. So Houston does not get totality, but what does Houston get you get, you get almost, almost. <laughs> you know this will uh for you the eclipse will last about two and a half hours that's how long it will take from the first nibble by the moon on the sun's disk until the last that'll run from 12 20 to about 301 um and then the middle of the eclipse will be at 140 and at that point anthony 94 percent of the sun's area will be covered by the moon all that will be left is a little thin crescent of the sun up in the sky. It, it's going to be very dramatic, but I have to say it will not be nearly as dramatic as if you can find your way to head north, to head west into the path of totality, because that is where the big show actually happens. And that's not a big drive for us. It, it literally, if you're waking up in the morning, now traffic is going to be an issue, but on a regular day, that's an hour and a half to get to the path going north or going northwest. Um, if we do that and we're in the path of totality, what are we going to see? Okay, well, you know, I try to put this in, in a context. Imagine on the 4th of July, I don't know what you do in Houston, but here in Boston, we have this massive concert and fireworks show uh, in downtown Boston. So it's seeing 94%, which you'll see in Houston, is like having one sparkler that you wave around and go, yay, versus being in the front row of the massive fireworks display. I mean, it's really that different. So when, when the moon shadow, when the moon covers the sun, you're literally standing in the shadow of the moon. It will get dark, and this is a pretty dark eclipse. It's one of the eighth longest total solar eclipses of this century. So it will be dark twilight all around you. Uh, uh, birds will stop singing. Animals will go to rest. It will drop in temperature 15 to 20 degrees. The brightest stars and planets will show up in, in the sky that's dark. And then up where the sun used to be, used to be in the sky, imagine a black bullet hole surrounded by this electric white wreath that is the sun's atmosphere, the corona. It is truly a multi-sensory experience. And, and on top of that, besides you're mentioning the, just this feathery uh, corona that is 2 million degrees, which is uh, much hotter than actually the surface of the sun, you're actually getting some other things that are just, to me, spectacular. When I was at the 2017 uh, eclipse in Oregon, what I loved and still can see vividly in my mind today is the diamond ring effect. I, it, that it was just spectacular. And there's also little tiny details like that with Bailey beads, uh, the chromosphere, for example, the prominescence. Can you describe each of those and when those occur? Sure. So, you know, um, the moon is not perfectly spherical. So as it covers the sun, there are little uh, irregularities along the edge. And so at just before the moon completely covers the sun, the last little streams of sunlight are streaming between valleys on the edge of the moon. And we call those Bailey's beads, first, uh, first noticed by an astronomer named Francis Bailey a very long time ago. Now, to your eye, you, of course, you're going to be using your 
safe solar glasses when you're doing this, right? So these will look like little tiny uh, droplets of sunlight along the edge, both when the, when the moon is just starting to cover the sun and when it's uncovering it. Now, by that point, everything will be dark enough. So much of the sun will be covered that the sky will be dark and you'll start to see this corona, the crown. Corona is Spanish for crown. And so it's the, the atmosphere of the sun as you described. And this combination of seeing the, the corona start to in, starting to emerge and that last little bit of sunlight combined to what we call the diamond ring. It's, it's really a spectacular thing. You'll be able to see it certainly through a camera and even by eye. And what I'd recommend is if you're going to totality and you want to see this diamond ring, wait until totality is over because then your eye will be already adjusted to the darkness. You'll see the corona at its best and you'll see that little blip of sunlight first appear on the edge of the on the edge of the moon that will that will give you the diamond ring you mentioned the chromosphere the chromosphere is the lowest uh, level of the sun's atmosphere and unlike the corona itself which is a brilliant white electric white the chromosphere is this incredible crimson color and you can see it in pictures it's kind of a magenta but it just doesn't match what your eye actually sees it's it's very vivid and very obvious uh, that that is just the, I mean, the way you describe that is just uh, fantastic, and I, I'm just so excited to see this because I saw one, and I can't wait to see the next. Oh, the weather forecast. This is uh, in April. It's severe weather season. Uh, you look at the northeastern United States, and uh, they're typically cloudy at this time of year. Where is the most likely place that you're going to see good weather come April right. eighth? Well, we're going to take the entire population of Houston, charter a whole bunch of buses, and go to Mazatlan, Mexico, because that is where the very best weather prospects are. But Anthony, you know, you know that weather is uh, climate is what you predict, and weather is what you get. And uh, it could be anything on Eclipse Day. We're dealing with this El Nino situation right now, which um, uh, meteorological studies have shown might actually improve the chances for clear skies. I would say in uh, in Texas, where you're at, Central Texas. The chance of clear skies statistically during the middle of the eclipse are pretty good, 60 or 70 percent. We'll just have to see what happens. All right. Hey, last question for you. Where are you going to be on solar eclipse day? I am going to be with 250 of my new best friends uh, at a location, a private location in Fredericksburg, Texas. This is near what we call the center line. And this is really important. You know, the path of the total, total eclipse is about 120 miles wide. You do not need to be in the center of that path in order to get the best effect. Just being 10 or 15 miles inside the edge will be enough to give you most of the duration that you would otherwise see. So we're headed to Texas. We're hoping for clear skies and, uh, you know, like you, uh, our fingers are crossed and we're, we're hoping for clear skies that